how do you recommend stuff? Do you use how much you liked it as a metric or maybe some characteristics of it are similar with each other? A theme, maybe? A plot trope? Or maybe even the creator who made it? I actually do want answers to this in the comments. I am genuinely curious about how people might recommend just bunches of media to other people. It can't just be one recommendation to another person. It has to be like a master list or something. Because ultimately, there's not really a set way to do that, right? But you know what really grinds my gears? You know what really makes me uncomfortable? Well, if you're a subscriber or have watched more than one of my videos, you probably have like several answers to that. <laughs> but I digress. What really pisses me off when people recommend things is when there's a direct dissonance in how they go about doing it. Now, this topic isn't new, per se. I know Yara Zaid made a similar video, particularly with South Korean cinema. The gist of which is that media from a particular identity can't be lumped together. Not a hot take, but it seems it still needs to be said. Kind of like in my fandom racism video, when I talk about how an anti-Chinese issue shouldn't warrant input from an Indian person, you know, lumping all Asian identities together doesn't mean that all Asian identities have anything in common apart from geographical proximity. And ignoring that leads to some pretty stupid situations. So let's apply that. A book recommendations list. You get your Felix Ever Afters, your Aristotle Dante Discover the Secrets of the Universes, or your We Are the Ants. All little coming-of-age queer lit novels, so this might be a queer coming-of-age recommendations list, right? Then they give you, I don't know, something like Long Way to a Small Negri Planet, or Iron Widow. Do you see what's going on here? Might be a little vague. Do over. Queer film wrecks. Let's say with an Asian focus. Down the list it goes, the half of it, The Handmaiden and Dear X. They're all from Netflix, they all feature some kind of queer character, some even multiple. Most characters are some kind of Asian. If you start with the half of it, there is no way you'd be expecting the amount of sex in The Handmaiden, or even the amount of casually used homophobia in Dear X. And despite all of these films being Asian, none of them come from the same country, or or even in the same languages. Hell, thematically, none of them even have any similarities between. Of these three films, you can barely string together any, apart maybe from the fact that most of the people aren't white and that they have or feature a queer character. This miscategorization doesn't really do much apart from completely disregarding what exactly these films are about and pissing me off. It's a non-issue, that much is certain. But it's a non-issue in the way that no one thinks to point out how incredible incredibly ridiculous it is that queer media, and especially queer media with characters of color, get lumped together. Not only by random people who haven't even looked in the direction of it, but also by avid consumers of it. Does that make sense? Now, <laughs> what in God's green earth does that have to do with Dear X? Okay, so here's what happened, right? I watched Dear X. It was good. It was funny. It was a little sad. I enjoyed it. I went on Tumblr to go see if they have any like gift sets of the movie so that I can go around touting it to kind of promote it to the people that follow me. And instead of finding that, I found this motherfucker. I'm not actually gonna use their Anyway, this motherfucker put the Rex on a recommendations list that was exactly like the last example I gave you, and it just it irked me so much that I went on this whole rant <sighs> on the same list. It's not even that one is better than the other or that recommending stories from creators of color is bad. That would just be taking what I'm saying in bad faith. I'm saying that recommending someone's story just because it has a character in the minority group you want people to consume more of is kind of tokenizing the stories itself. Because no matter how you look at it, those stories aren't just about the queerness of its characters, it's about what they're trying to tell you. So, let's break down your ex. Shishin Aishantada is a Taiwanese film that was released in 2018, directed by Mag Shu and Xu Qian, and written by Mag Shu and Lu Xiyuan. Literally translates to Who Fell in Love with Him First? but it's best known by its English title, Dear X. It's down on Netflix, go watch it. The film is in the perspective of young Sung Cheng Shi, 
his mother Lu Sin Lian, and his late father's longtime lover Jay, as they come together in the wake of his father's passing, as apparently Cheng Yuan left the inheritance money to Jay instead of his wife and son. There's a fair bit of homophobia in this film, so bear that in mind before watching, and in spite of it all, I try to empathize with Lu Sin Yan, which is all the film can ask for, really. And before we head into the nitty gritty, I'm giving you this bit of a heads up for spoilers for that film and Batay na si Jesus, literally Jesus is Dead, is a 2017 Cebuano film directed by Victor Villanueva and written by Patrick Tabata. Now, I'm about to tell you about this film because in its entirety, the themes, choice of narrative, and overall story of Patay na si Jesus and their ex are shaking hands. Vigorously. It's on Netflix too. By the way, I'm not actually sure if either of these films are on international Netflix databases. So if you want to watch them, you can pirate the Rx, but honestly just use a VPN for Patay na si Jesus because I am pretty sure that's just for local release. And trust me, I tried looking for a torrent and found none, so yeah. Now, Patay na si Jesus is one of those films I haven't actually seen on a queer Asian film list. Which is kind of surprising since one of its subplots is a trans man having a falling out with his lover despite the love he showers over her and her daughter. And it's a subplot that kind of commentates on the main plot of the film itself. Anyway, Batay na si Jesus is about E.I. forcing her sons, Bert, Jude, and Jay, on a road trip to their estranged father's funeral. The whole thing is that they haven't seen Jesus in years, and to go to the funeral, they'd have to stay at a wake that's largely been arranged by Jesus' recent uh, mistress family. Since divorce is illegal in the Philippines, though E.I. and Jesus have long since separated and E.I. has largely raised their children alone, she's still technically his wife. It's complicated. Anyway, there's our first thing on the list. The dead cheating father. Jesus and Cheng Yuan don't have much in common apart from being dead cheaters who screwed over all their loved ones. Sung Cheng Yuan was a college professor who helped run a local theater. There he met Jay, and due to a little prop error, Lu Sun Yan. In the following years, he kept up his little tag team affair despite getting married and becoming a father. Eventually, he came out to Sun Yan and asked her for a divorce. She denied him that, saying that she didn't want Cheng Shi to have any difficulties later in his life. Eventually, Cheng Yuan got sick, like terminally sick, and Jay had to take care of him until his death, calling in Sun Yan as soon as news of his death came. Our story starts when, turns out, Cheng Yuan gave most of his inheritance money that was supposed to go to Cheng Shi, now 17, to Jay. Looking at it like that, it does seem like it's only fair for Jay to have received the money, considering Cheng Yuan spent most of his last years on Earth with the man, with Jay doing the bare minimum of like staying with his lover instead of breaking up because taking care of him was too difficult. But that's not the point here, is it? On the flip side, much about Tesus and E.I. is left to interpretation. There's not a lot we know about Tesus apart from his sister Linda, oddly the same name as his final lover, and everything E.I. reveals to the audience through conversations with other characters. E.I. and Tesus allegedly eloped to Cebu even though E.I. didn't speak a lick of Cebuano, and years after they broke up over a different mistress, he apparently tried to make it up with her one last time. Not that it mattered. And in his death, as is shown in the beginning of the film, and even as the plot develops, it's pretty much shown to the audience, albeit absurdly, that there are some considerable regrets mixed into E.I.'s aloofness about his death, and some hints into what may have happened between her and Jesus. It's all in the subplots. With Jay's pregnancy scare and attempt to flee responsibility, perhaps that had been what Tissus had been feeling upon having his children with E.I. That all he wanted out of their elopement was the thrill of courtship and the rose-tinted glasses of youth. He didn't sign up for, well, fatherhood, so he cheated on her. Then it flips on its head. As soon as Jesus had wanted to get back together with E.I., she'd already found another lover. Through Jude's storyline, you see that despite having loved his lover's child and the appeal of fatherhood, that hadn't been enough. So then we get Bert's development, of him finally moving on and despite his regrets, still finding love later in life, regardless of what E.I. feels about it. That's mostly my theory, but it seems very likely, right? 
But in the end, neither story is really about these dead cheating fathers. Grieving someone you grew to hate. Iai and Lu Sanyan hate their husbands. That much is true. Iai was left with three children and having no knowledge of Sabuana. The man she loved left her for another woman, and when the film begins, she's taken on what seems to be a boyfriend. Nothing serious. Her children have all graduated and have their own lives outside hers. Jude has set out to live with his girlfriend, while Bert and Jay live with her at home but are mostly out in the town. They also have Hudas. It's clear that she's moved on until news of his death hits and the amount of repression she has about the topic is brought to the forefront. Yu Sun Yen, after 13 years of raising Song Ching Shi by herself, well, she hasn't taken on a lover and she seems to be set on just making sure Ching Shi lives a good life. He's a little rebellious because of her overbearingness and she seems to be taking the right steps to make sure they don't take it out on each other with varying results. It definitely seems like she never moved on, but it isn't, you know, isn't willing to acknowledge it. But in watching the Erex, it occurred to me that the primary motivations of these women's continued marriages to these unfaithful men, and the way they coped with it, might not garner the same sympathies. While Ei remained in wedlock involuntarily due to the law, Sunyan didn't file a divorce because she believed it to be beneficial for her child, with the added bonus of her handling Cheng Yuan's coming out rather poorly. But consider, right? Your husband finally returns from being incredibly absent for what seems like three or four years now, leaving you to essentially deal with your child yourself. You thought maybe he's a bit of a traditionalist and he wants you to deal with a child while he goes to work even though you have work too, but then suddenly he tells you he wants a divorce because he wasn't into you. It's a little sudden, and honestly there's no good way to take that. Or in Cheng Yuan's case, <laughs> there's no way to break it to her easily. Especially not in the scene and mindset she was in when she finally saw Cheng Yuan again, eager to make things work between them, give their relationship that same spark that gave them Cheng Shi in the first place. Sanyan has this moment with Cheng Shi's therapist that really stuck to me as the one truly defining moment Sanyan has. She asked the doctor whether the love between her and Cheng Yuan was real at all. Because yes, she's a little homophobic, but that doesn't erase Cheng Yuan's infidelity from the start, does it? Looking through accounts of queer people who came out years into a marriage, it seems pretty common, particularly for gay men, to stay in the closet due to toxic masculinity. But you don't really see Cheng Yuan question his masculinity. For the most part, jokes about effeminacy land directly into Jay's court instead, and yeah, though these scenes are viewed in the perspective of the people he left behind, you never get the sense that he actually loved Chen Yuan in the first place, or that the attraction was at all mutual. What's interesting about Chen Yuan's conflict with coming out is that he's scared of not being loved by people. That's why he doesn't want Jay to introduce him to his mother, why it took him years of hiding his experience with Jay from Sun Yen. And honestly, I'm in defense of Sun Yen here, because why would you want her love when you never even loved her back? Because you can't deny that. The title, the literal translation and the English version, suggests basically that in Chen Yuan's perspective, after coming out, it's just Jay. Sun Yen is his ex. And the only real reason he lasted that long with her was Cheng Shi, who he did actually genuinely love as a son. You get the chance meeting between Sun Yen and Cheng Yuan at the penultimate moment of Jay's plot, for fuck's sake. The film is beating you over the head. But though both these people fell in love with him, only one of them got to prove whose love was actually legitimate. Hilariously, that's a joke they made in Patay Nas Jesus. In the drive to Tumaguete, Jude and Ei have a conversation about whether Jesus loved Ei at all, considering he left her for another woman. And Ei points out that though Jesus did have other lovers and even had children with his last, she was the only one he married. I suppose that's just within the realm of the Filipino tendency to over-sanctify marriage because of Catholicism, but there is a kind of poeticism to the idea of a vow of holy commitment that would appeal to any scorned lover. But the difference is glaring. In the Erex, it's not who Cheng Yuan married whose love was proven to bear more weight, but the one he would have married if he could. Same-sex marriage wasn't legal in Taiwan until 2019, a year after this film was released. And I suppose that's what makes the Erex that much sadder. In Patay Nasi Jesus, you at least understand that though Ei and Jesus have long separated, the love they had for each other was real. <laughs> what was it? Alina's sister said it a while ago. Uh, 
we felt the scourge of content before. Hey, even if it was about bad TV writing, who's to say it's not applicable to Dear X? Pairs of glasses. Stories are vision impaired. That should probably be something they tell you in creative writing classes, but let me explain. All stories need framing. These are either narrators, narrative characters, or narrative devices, depending on the perspective you use, which sets a limit on what a narration can and can't tell you. So you have something to look through that has significant limits on what you can and can't see or know. In some narratives, you can't hear the thoughts of most characters. Just one. In some, you can know everything, but not really the thing you want to know because the narrative devices and characters themselves are inherently unreliable. Your experience of this story is largely shaped by what you can and can't know and when and how you know it. Simple enough. So, in DRX, we allegedly have a narrative character, Song Chengxi. He's trying to figure out if Jay scammed his father into giving him the inheritance. But then, once Chengxi figures out that Jay is ignorant about what he and Sun Yin are hounding Jay for, the narration shifts. Suddenly, you get flashes of Cheng Yun's time and words with Jay, and as I've mentioned earlier, Sun Yin gets her moment as well, where you get to find out how Cheng Yun and Sun Yin met and left each other. Though this shifting in perspective is a little unorthodox and kind of misleading because of the initial motivation Cheng Xi has in staying with Jay, it's needed to give you the answers you need. They even gave you the question to begin with, visually. But Thanosius has a simpler form of framing its story. EI is the central character, but everything is viewed through side glances and inferring meaning. You're given the sense that EI doesn't want to face Jesus' death and what it means to her directly. So you get subplots about her children and scenes where they try to have conversations with her about her feelings about his death, and in every single one of them, she doesn't make a big deal out of it. There's just, I don't know, maybe this is just Jacqueline Jose's stellar performance as EI, but you can just feel a depth to her character that goes beyond her three children and her dead cheating husband. And it's that restraint that really makes you feel like it's not just because the creators chose not to give EI that backstory, but because EI herself doesn't want anyone to see inside. That's why you don't get narration, that's why her story is revealed through inference and side glances. In the end, what really interests me about these two films is their differences in the way they show this grief. I don't know, especially in the Philippines, I don't think there's really much in the way of nuance with the way women at a certain age are written. It's always playing into stereotypes and boxing them into archetypical roles. So I appreciate stories like this where women get to be just people imperfect but not villainized or victimized for it. Though there is a fair bit of bigotry that I thought wasn't really necessary, like the slurs Jay endures in direct. Oh, maybe that's just the translation, I don't know. The people who understand Mandarin, please tell me if it was just that vulgar. Or the way Jud gets constantly misgendered in Patayna Jesus. But I can sit through some discomfort knowing that it was done to make a point. That in the end, Jud and Jay get some happiness and understanding out of the deal. Also, this is the first time I've seen an actual trans dude treated with dignity in Filipino cinema. Let me have it. <laughs> Anyhow, this got a little long. I originally wanted to make this a two-parter so that I didn't have to make everyone sit through a longer than usual video. But I don't think I'm capable of making something that long or stretching a topic out for two whole videos. Brevity is the wit of soul, etc. etc. Liked and comments are appreciated if I got y'all to watch either of these films. I want feedback. I want reviews. I want everyone to talk to me about it. <laughs> Support would be appreciated. I just migrated tip jars and with that comes a Discord server for all supporters where I'll be posting updates, early access, bloopers, and more. So if that sounds cool and if you want your name at the end of these videos, make sure to support me on Ko-fi. Oh, also I started a podcast with Gab. I've mentioned her in a few videos. And she works with me on Reverse AU as well. So <laughs> if you want more casual media reviews from me, go listen to The Secret Treehouse wherever you listen to your podcasts. We came out with our first episode this month and uh, we talked about Mamma Mia. So please, go check that out. Stay safe. Ingat tayong lahat. Bye.